Good afternoon. My name is Mickey Fulp. I'm the mercenary geologist. Uh, you can find my website at mercenarygeologist.com and you can email me at contact at mercenarygeologist.com. As a disclaimer, I must say I'm not a certified financial analyst or a professional qualified to offer investment advice. Uh, nothing in this presentation can be construed as recommendation or an offer or solicitation to buy or sell stock. Today we're going to talk about the Yukon area plays and separating the very few contenders in this space from the very many pretenders. If you're familiar with my work, you know that I have four key criteria in evaluating junior resource stocks for speculation. And notice I said speculation. I did not say investment. An investment is something that you expect a return on on a regular basis. And certainly that is not what we have in the junior resource sector. My four key criteria are share structure, people, projects, and finally undervalued with respect to its peers. So being a field geologist, uh, 30 years plus uh, in the field as a practicing exploration or economic geologist, if you will, uh, I have a uh, I have the ability to look at projects and make a decision quite quickly. So I generally look at a company's project first when I am evaluating it for speculation. Uh, I insist on a priority target, and that can be a flagship property which will have a good chance of becoming a producing and a profitable mine, or occasionally a prospect generator. And if you uh, read and are familiar with my writings, you know what a prospect generator does. Uh, a junior has a time life. Uh, generally, the average junior is going to be around in its present form uh, on the order of, say, five to seven, perhaps eight years. At that point, they generally become too diluted to be uh, of interest anymore. So uh, when I'm looking at a prospect or a project, I want to make sure that it can be developed, say, say something within the half-life of the average junior, so three or four years. And that very much depends on the commodity. I'm very particular about the commodities that juniors are exploring uh, or developing. Uh, my current focus is on gold deposits, copper oxide deposits, uranium deposits, and rare earth elements. And it, within that context, we should also look at the deposit type and a potential metal content. So uh, it, for instance, in gold space, I am very much interested in sediment-hosted gold, so-called carlin-type gold deposits, or uh, epithermal uh, deposits that can be uh, mined in an open pit situation, which means they can be developed and uh, processed without counterparty risk and also in a short time frame. Uh, and also a project's very dependent on its location uh, and the geopolitical environment with which it is uh, where it's located. Let's go on to share structure net. Uh, the key criteria in share structure are the number of shares outstanding and the number of shares fully diluted. I also look at the share price, uh, the highs and lows within a 52-week period, a 30-day period, and a daily uh, high-low to get an idea about when it might be time to buy a particular stock I'm interested in. One of the uh, Achilles heels, if you will, about junior resource companies uh, is the lack of a liquidity. Uh, they are often very 
thinly traded, and uh, so liquidity is a very important part of the equation too, especially when you go to sell. If there's not a demand for your stock, then you're going to have a very hard time in selling it. And finally, I'm very particular about any sort of litigation. I basically will not touch a stock that has uh, some so any sort of legal issue, pending legal issue. When we're looking at share structure, we want to look at uh, the insider's family and friends holdings, the so-called tightly held portion of the stock, which is the real base for uh, the company and gives it a very solid uh, foundation from which to operate. Also, we'll look at institutional holdings. Institutional holdings can be, be both good and bad. For instance, if uh, a particular institution controls 10 or 20 percent of the stock, then the uh, management of that stock and, and therefore the shareholders are beholden to the will and uh, of that particular institution, and that may not be in the best interest of other shareholders. And we also want to look at the public stock flow because that is where liquidity comes in with a retail lay investor, people like you and me who are generally not committed long-term investors of a stock but uh, looking for uh, trades and profits. Uh, we also want to look at warrants and options, whether they are in the money or out of the money, they can affect the short-term or even the medium term price of the stock and in conjunction with that we need to look at the expiry dates of and to know when those options and warrants will be exercised. Uh, in addition for share structure we want to look at the working capital, the cash and equities uh, and the burn rate and that will include G&A and exploration because that gives you an idea of, of when the company needs to go to the market the next time uh, to uh, uh, finance its operations because all juniors basically finance through uh, increasing uh, the equity position of the company and therefore diluting current shareholders. Uh, most junior exploration companies do not have long-term debt, but that's something you also want to look at. And short-term debt is very important. That tells you if the company is, gonna, is currently paying their bills, and if they aren't, that raises a red flag right away. And then you also want to look at recent financings uh, and see what's proposed, what's amended, what's been closed, and especially if it's been canceled or amended, tells you there may be something uh, wrong with the company and the financing is not going very well. Uh, a, a recent private placement and the warrants issue will tend to put a cap on the share price at least uh, in uh, the short term and certainly uh, within the four month hold period right after that uh, if the stock's gone up you're going to have people taking profits going to depress the price of the stock. Uh, Finally, in my three key criteria that form the basis for a decision on a company, we we'll want to look at the people. The management team, uh, which would consist of the CEO and the president, the CFO, and the board of directors. And we want to make sure that the uh, CEO, I prefer a, uh, a technical person for the CEO, either a geologist or an engineer, because they really understand the business of uh, finding, uh, developing, and putting a mine in production. Uh, within that, we will ha also have a technical team, which will consist of a chief operating officer, a chief geologist, a VP of exploration. Well, what's the difference? Well, the chief geologist is the guy that manages the technical side of the exploration pl program, while the VP of exploration is usually someone who is a manager, uh, uh, lets drill contracts, manages and proposes budgets, etc. Uh, there will also be, if it's an advanced project, mining and metallurgical engineers, and uh, then a staff of senior and junior geologists and engineers. Uh, oftentimes, the best companies will have an advisory board, and that will be key consultants on both the technical and the financial aspects of the business. 
Uh, when we look at the people, we want to look at their educational and professional backgrounds and their bios, their experience in the junior resource sector, not just their experience in junior capital markets and venture capital, but I insist that they have previous experience in the junior resource sector and they must have success in that. Uh, in that arena. Uh, a company that, or, or a person, let me say, that is, uh, has been bankrupt or been associated with three bankrupt companies, I do not consider an entrepreneur or a good venture capitalist. Uh, we also want to look at the compensation. Uh, are they overcompensated? There is certainly, uh, within the June, junior resource uh, sector on the Toronto Stock Exchange, uh, people that have found a way to make a living on the public company dole. So you want to look at their salaries, and not only that, but their management fees uh, and options and bonuses, the whole compensation package. If that is out of sort, out of whack, much higher than the, uh, say, the industry average for a junior resource company, that raises a red flag right away. Uh, finally, I want to see technical expertise uh, within the board of directors. Uh, my ideal board of directors composed of geologists and engineers with one financier, one lawyer, and one accountant. If you see a board of directors headed by a bunch of lawyers and ex-brokers and accountants that raise a red flag right away because they're not going to have the technical expertise to advance a project. And finally, let's talk about insider selling. Uh, uh, and that's not only illegal insider selling, but what I would call Ill, uh, insider trading. Uh, when you see rampant and repeated insider trading by the people associated with management at the top of a company, that raises a real big red flag for me, and it is, in my opinion, the bane of the junior resource sector. I will not touch companies that have rampant insider selling. So in my process of evaluating a junior resource company, uh, let, let's say this. There's 1,750 of these companies on the Toronto and Venture Exchange. 50% of those will fail my criteria for f flagship project. 25% will fail on the on the share structure. An additional 15% will fail on the management or technical teams. And finally, 5% will fail on website presentation. If they do not have a good website and complete website presentation, including technical information for the geologists and analysts and the brokers and people that are professionals to evaluate the company, that's a fail for me. So you add all that up, and 95% of the companies on the Toronto and Venture exchanges will fail my key criteria for share structure people and projects. So within that, so we've taken 95% uh, fail, and as a final test, uh, my final test is the company has to be undervalued when compared to its peer. Now. There are uh, very easy criteria. There's a number of brokerage houses and, and banks and analysts who publish uh, peer valuations for a company, generally on the amount of metal in the exploration business in the ground. Uh, if you've noticed, if you look at, and I, I will dare you to find me a, an active junior, not a dormant junior, but an active junior who uh, share price from its 52-week high to its 52 week, any given 52-week uh, period, high to low is not at least a double. So that gives us our end right now. Uh, the undervalue is very dependent on the timing of the company. What was undervalued two years ago is is may or may not be undervalued today. If I pick a stock because it's undervalued. If I'm doing my work right, it will not be an undervalued stock within a month or six months or 12 months. And 12 months is kind of my deadline for a stock to double. The key in this is you want to buy at low volumes. And if you notice, low volumes generally mean correlate with low prices and sell at high volumes. So within any 250-week period, given a junior will double, if you buy at low volume and sell at high volume, you're going to double your money. Simple as that. 
And I call this the power of two, my investing philosophy. And that basically is the stock price uh, must double in 12 months or less, otherwise I will not speculate in the stock. When it doubles, I sell half of my position. That gives me a cost basis of zero, and I still have half of my position left. So then I'm playing with someone else's money, or I'm playing with house money, or I even may be playing with your money by that time. And so we take that capital, we preserved our capital, we re reinvest in another undervalued stock. Uh, I have open orders to sell one half of a double on the 29 stocks I currently hold. Uh, we program sell at intervals on the uptick, so we're continually taking profits off the table from our zero uh, cash basis, uh, cost basis stock. And we set profit stops. And I don't call these stop losses, but they are essentially stops for bear dips in the market or a company does not perform uh, after it's achieved its double or the market is bad or for whatever reason, we set stops on the downtick so we are continually taking profits. It's a program sell uh, sort of scenario. Uh, we reinvest time and time again. We preserve capital and we gain half positions in more and more stocks. If you do this five times, you still have your capital preserved and you have half positions in five stocks that, that you have zero cost basis, and you're ready to do it a sixth time. It's a very simple way. This is an infallible way to make money in the junior resource sector, assuming that you make good stock picks to begin. So now let's switch to area plays. And we're going to talk about the Yukon area play. And as a review, I want to review, I want to go over the last six area plays that I remember since I became involved in the junior resource st sector. The first one was Hemlo, Ontario. <clears throat> the discovery was made at Hemlo in 1983. There were mines being built by 1984, but they were consolidated as one deposit. So out of that big area play, and if you've been around for that many years as I have, you know what a big area play that was. That was a grassroots discovery uh, 15 meters from the Trans-Canada Highway. It led to dozens and perhaps even a hundred juniors flooding into the uh, northern Ontario uh, area around Marathon, Ontario. And, uh, and out of all of that, the original discovery was the only mine ever developed, the only big mine developed in that area. Same at SK Creek, same guy, Murray Pezum, uh was responsible for that. Uh, SK Creek was discovered, the big discovery is made on the 109th hole. That rush, which made very of my, many of my peers that were involved in it, many geologists uh, became rich on that one. Uh, that resulted in one mine. The next one was the diamonds in the Northwest Territories. Uh, one mine originally discovered uh, by Diavik or by uh, uh, Chuck Fipke's uh, 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 syndicate uh, became the the uh, uh, Diavik mine, and now we have uh, uh, three mines in the area, three big diamond mines. But it took. 20 years to develop those three diamond mines. We had two right away. But that whole diamond scenario, which moved the market in the early 90s, only resulted in three mines. The next one, two years later, was Voises Bay. That resulted in one mine. People flooded to Labrador looking for the next Voise Bay. Uh, we're now, what, uh, uh, seven, 18 years past that discovery. There is still only one nickel mine in the entire province of Labrador. Uh, the next one was Purina in Peru, Arequipa Resources, another of David Lowell's successes. That resulted in two mines. The second mine, Alto Chicama, was discovered by Barrick uh, seven years after the dis or, excuse me, six years after the discovery of Purina. So within that very big area of northern Peru, there have been two windfall profit mines or giant mines developed out of that. 
the latest area play was La Bodega in Colombia that happened uh, uh, a couple of years ago. We still don't have a mine. Uh, as I look at everything that's gone on in Colombia, I only see one windfall profit mine, and that will be, uh, likely be uh, Ventana Gold's uh, La Bodega deposit. So the point to take here is these new area plays do not result in very many mines. Uh, Yukon area plays. So uh, my friend Glenn Jones, and you will know him at the conferences, he's the guy that has all the free land maps uh, in Tierra Resource Intelligence, told me yesterday there are 140 TSX and, and venture companies with uh, plays in the Yukon. 95% of those will fail my key criteria right off the bat. Uh, that means that six to eight companies of 140 will uh, pass my criteria for uh, consideration on speculation. But how many of those are undervalued right now? Well, it's a Yukon area play. I would say very, very few. And if we look at the history of area plays for the last nearly 30 years since Hemlo, uh, there will be one to three giant or windfall profit mines discovered and developed. So that gives you an idea of the odds we're faced with. Okay, here's a, a, a map provided by Mike Berkey of the U, uh, Yukon Geological Survey, soon to be in the private sector again. C congratulations, Mike. But I want to show you uh, the areas that are of importance in the Yukon. People call it the Yukon Area Play. It's actually Yukon Area Plays. So within this, we have the White Gold District around uh, uh, Dawson and, and to the south. Uh, I would include that within that, the entire Dawson range. And that is in the west central of BC, where you see all those yellow and orange dots concentrated. Uh, on the northeast part of that trend is the old uh, tombstone intrusive suite uh, deposits such as Brewery Creek and Dublin Gulch. They have been revamped, but those are not new discoveries. They are old projects that uh, uh, failed in the past and now with a higher price of gold, perhaps they will be discovered. Immediately to the east of that, uh, you see a couple of dots out there going into East Central Yukon, and that would be the uh, RAL trend uh, of attack resources, and that is certainly a new grassroots discovery. And then the rest of that, kind of in the uh, uh, South Central and Southeast parts of uh, the Yukon, are just recycled projects from previous booms, including uh, the 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 lead zinc deposits the Selwyn Basin and the VMS is discovered in the 80s and 90s in south uh, southeastern BC so those are just recycled projects too so basically we've got a couple of areas that are hot with new discoveries the risk in the Yukon area plays are, are significant uh, and basically they have to do with location. Uh, they are remote. There is little to no infrastructure throughout most of the Yukon. Uh, for instance, the Osiris uh, project of, uh, of attack resources is 100 kilometers from the nearest road. We also have, because it's uh, in the Arctic, uh, region. We have uh, climate uh, issues and a very much seasonality of work. You can basically work up there for four or five months of the year and then you're snowed out. This leads to very high cost exploration. So the burn rates of these companies are going to be extreme. It also results in unsteady news flow and there will be a dearth of news over the winter here as, as the final drill results from the summer and fall are released then field work will not start up again for the most part until perhaps May. So we're going to see a dearth of news. Uh, the also the the remoteness and the climate is going to lead to very high cap X for development of these deposits and a high operating costs. 
What makes a good mind? Well, we all know that uh, uh, b we have this incredible uh, boom and bust of commodity cycles. Now, I personally think we're in a secular bull market for commodities, but the timing, because of the cycles, the timing of development and production are key. You want to go in when, uh, not at the top of the market, not when commodity uh, prices are are at their peak, but generally when they're low, by the time you develop your mind, you'll hopefully hit the next cycle. For a junior, you want relatively low cap X because otherwise your only exit strategy is sell to a bigger uh, uh, to, uh, a bigger company, a major, and that means you have to have a major size deposit. So juniors have limited ability to. Uh, raise capital, so you want relatively low capital expenditures on the project they're interested in. And finally, this is going to be a key in the uh, Yukon. You need to be within the lowest quartile of operating costs because that ensures your viability throughout the uh, low prices of a commodity cycle. So let's look at a couple of companies here, and I'm going to review a couple of better companies, and you're going to hear lots of talk about these companies. They're well run, and they have legitimate projects. So this is Kamenak. You see the great rise, uh, the discovery uh, at the coffee deposit in August, the spike up, and then the general trend down on decreasing volumes. Uh, I've talked to technical analysis guys. I've been watching Kamenak. Uh, as the winter progresses, we are going to see, I think, lower prices for Kamenak. My technical analysis guy, Gary Tanashian. Gary, I would suggest you look into his newsletter called uh, Notes from the Rabbit Hole. He's a TA guy, and he is telling me that $2.40 is his target price to buy Kamenek. Hasn't gotten there yet, but if you look at the trend, you have a, a, a so-called flag there between the high trend and low trend, and $2.40 might be a, t uh, a place to uh, take a look at Kamenek. The next one is attack, and you see it uh, rolling along there. Uh, this is a well-run, very long-lived junior by people who have worked in the in the Yukon for a long period of time. We see the spike up with a discovery uh, at Rao and uh, and the high share price of nine dollars in uh, mid-November and a steeply plummeting price since then. Uh, it's been treading water since uh, the first uh, couple of weeks of 2011. Uh, Gary tells me that he's looking at a target price of about 450. With the dearth of news in the Yukon, perhaps these stocks uh, will reach uh, his target prices. But I just want to tell you that uh, TAC was 90 million shares outstanding and a and a price around uh, six dollars right now has a, has a market cap of five hundred forty million dollars on nothing but a couple of drill holes. So this is pure speculation, folks. There is a lot of risk. Finally, I'll talk about my favorite company uh, in the Yukon right now. Uh, my clicker is fairly slow here, so bear with me. And that's Tarsus Resources. And Tarsus, as you can see, has had quite a run up. Uh, it's changed its tactics uh, uh, from over the last uh, year or so. It's became a prospect generator in the Yukon. As you very well know, I love the prospect generator model. Uh, we see a start. A, a significant rise in stock price. It got as high as uh, actually touched uh, 71 cents on interday high. 
uh, not shown in the chart. This is closing uh, prices, and it has drifted down. I would suggest that Tarsus could be a buying opportunity at its current prices. It is very tightly held stock with 15 million shares out. Do the math at a 50 cent price right now has a market cap of seven and a half million dollars. Compare that with some of the high flyers in the Yukon right now. The other thing it has going for is a sister company of another very successful prospect generator that I covered in July at 90 cents uh, has been as high as uh, $5.46. That's Almaden. So Tarsus has the same management, the same major shareholders of Almaden. That is my top pick in the Yukon. Uh, when you're picking junior resource companies, you must do your own due, gel due diligence. I want to tell you that your own personal research is the most important thing that you will ever do when you speculate. I like to say a day without learning is a day wasted. I have a company evaluation template that I would be willing to to offer any of my free email subscribers. Become a subscriber if you are not already one. Everything I do is free on the internet. I will send you my company evaluation template. Buena suerte inversionistas, which means in Spanish, good luck investors. Uh, I run a free email subscriber service. I do lots of radio, lots of TV, and I write a couple of times a month. My newsletter is called Monday Morning Musings from Mickey the Mercenary Geologist. Go to my website, sign up, request a free evaluation template. Most of you see me uh, in, in a monkey suit all the time, but I am a field geologist. This is a picture of uh, the Tutagon in northern BC where I made an outcropping gold discovery in 2006. And finally, I want to give credit to a man who was one of my very good friends. I knew R Ricardo Presnell uh, from my work at Kennecott starting in 1988. I would dare say that Ricardo in his uh, exploration for Kennecott in the Yukon in, from 1996 to 1999, this is the man who figured out that deep auger soil sampling was the way to go. And everything that's come out of the Yukon since then, uh, I think Ricardo kick-started it between 1999 or 1996 and 1999. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I will be available for questions not after my talk after this talk but sometime over the course of two days uh, certainly in my booth we will set aside some time for uh, general Q&A who uh, from anyone who uh, desires more from the mercenary geologist thank you goodbye